Good morning, and thank you for being here. Uh, we are joined again, as usual, by Dr. Joe Kanner. Uh, he will speak and take questions in a moment. Um, one week ago, when we had our, our press conference on last Thursday, I announced a new all-time record of daily COVID cases. At that time, it was just over 14,000 cases in a 24-hour period. Uh, yesterday, we broke that record again. Um, and it wasn't even close, 17,592 new cases. Um, for comparison, our single day record during the Delta surge was 7,548 cases that were reported on August the 13th. So we've more than doubled that uh, at this point in this Omicron surge, which reflects what we've known for a long time now that this variant is much more transmissible and it is infecting more people on average than any of the prior strains of, of the virus that we have encountered. There's also a growing number of people who've contracted COVID more than once. Uh, and this is something that is now being reported on the dashboard. We're trying to be as up to date and as transparent as we can be. So we have the COVID dashboard and they're not yet included in our overall COVID case counts, uh, but they will be starting next week. Uh, yesterday we reported 2,384 new reinfections and 35,819 total reinfections since the start of the pandemic. The Department of Health is analyzing this data. It's going to be able to share uh, what the vaccination status breakdown is of this group uh, in the future. Um, the best information we have right now, at least that information coming out of Washington, is that 60% of reinfections between September and December were among the unvaccinated. Uh, and so this sort of proves what we've known for a while. You can't rely on the natural immunity conferred uh, by a previous bout with uh, COVID-19 in order to continue to protect you over time. Um, especially now that we are a year removed from the height of the alpha and months removed from the height of the delta surges. If you've had COVID in 2020, for example, uh, and you decided that you were gonna rely on the natural immunity conferred by that uh, experience with the disease and, and not to be vaccinated, uh, you're quite frankly not protected. Uh, and we know that natural immunity wanes over time. Um, and we've also been saying that, that vaccinations wane over time too, but that's why you get fully vaccinated and then you get boosted uh, when you can. Uh, and what we know uh, is very promising about the protection conferred about vaccines, especially if you are boosted, because if you're vaccinated and boosted, you're 10 times less likely to contract COVID in the first place, you're 17 times less likely to end up in the hospital, and you're 20 times less likely to die. So when you look at the protection afforded by natural immunity and that afforded by vaccination, hands down, vaccinations with, with, with uh, being boosted uh, is gonna protect you much, much more. Uh, and, and obviously when it protects you, it protects your family and your community, your coworkers and, and everyone else. So we want to make sure the public is getting as accurate a picture as possible of what this surge uh, and our COVID situation looks like today. Uh, and without including the enormous number of recent reinfections, I think we're missing a big part of that picture. Uh, Dr. Kander is going to share more about that in just a moment. I also want to talk about hospitalizations and the notion that Omicron is not dangerous enough to be concerned about. Uh, that is clearly false. Um, and as we said last week, is Omicron less violent? Yes, thankfully so. Um, but there are many, many people who are severely sick, uh, and we have an awful lot of people in the hospital uh, and a number of young people. We're going to get to that. So with 2,081 people hospitalized with COVID today, we have eclipsed our January 2021 height. Uh, and that we had 2,069 uh, a year ago hospitalized. That was the, the, the most we had on a single day uh, back during that particular surge. Uh, 
last week, we talked about the early evidence showing that Omicron on average tends to be less severe. Um, but you can draw the long, wrong lessons from that because that's clearly not the case across the board. Uh, far from it. Uh, and, you know, so there, are, there are some people, and you hear this, you know, uh, from, from folks and on social media and otherwise, well, since this is a little less severe, let's go ahead and, and catch it. Well, I, I will tell you that is not a good strategy. Uh, you don't want to get COVID, period. Um, because even even the cases that are referred to as mild will make you uh, feel sick and very sick in some cases. Um, it means that you can probably manage your symptoms at home if you have a mild case. Um, but we have seen many, many cases where uh, symptoms have persisted for a very long time. Um, and it isn't like if you choose to, to uh, expose yourself and contract COVID, you can also decide which uh, or how severe your case of COVID is going to be. I mean, you just, you just can't do that. Um, you do get to choose, however, whether you have the best possible protection against being hospitalized and dying. Um, and if, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, that does mean being vaccinated and being boosted. Uh, and we know that the more people who end up in the hospital, the tougher things are going to be for our state, for the hospitals that are trying to deliver care, for anyone who needs care, not just the COVID patients, but for whatever reason, somebody might, might need to go to the hospital and receive uh, life-saving care. Uh, you know, it, it's not like that when you have a, a pandemic with COVID, you don't have other things happening. Uh, for example, the flu or perhaps automobile accidents, strokes, heart attacks, you, you, you name it. Those things still happen. And I want to go back and, and talk about this, too, this, this idea that, that some people think, well, let's just go ahead and, and get it and get it over with. You remember we used to talk in terms of flattening the curve. And that's so that too many people don't end up with the disease all at once because that's what presents so much pressure on the healthcare delivery system that it just, it just can't manage. Um, and so you have to extend the time horizon over which people will be uh, positive for the disease, but also you want that lumber to be as low as possible uh, because that's how you protect the capacity in your hospital system. And so it, it's very irresponsible and dangerous for an individual, based on what might happen to that individual, uh, should they contract COVID. But collectively speaking, you know, uh, it, it's it's a very dangerous situation for the state too if that happens. Um, and we know that Omicron is much more transmissible, so we are seeing record numbers of cases anyway. Uh, and it is putting a real strain on our healthcare delivery system. So just wanted to make sure that, that we are addressing that. The CDC is also reporting a record number of children hospitalized across the nation right now with COVID. Uh, and we're certainly seeing that increase uh, in COVID hospitalizations among children in Louisiana. Um, and, you know, that includes zero to four year olds as well. Uh, people who are too young uh, to even be eligible for a vaccine. Uh, last week, uh, I'm sorry, looking at the latest week of complete data in the week of January the 2nd, 92 children were admitted to the hospital with COVID in our state. That's higher than we saw during the Delta surge. Now, during the Delta surge, we had uh, on August the 18th, I think it was, the most people hospitalized at any time. Uh, and on August 18th, that number was 3,022. But we have more children hospitalized today than we did at the height of the Delta peak. And so people who think that this is harmless for children, it's clearly not. And I know that, that uh, you know, here, here we are just a couple of months away from uh, the second anniversary of this pandemic. And after the 22 months or whatever it's been, people are tired. Um, and I get that. Uh, quite frankly, I am too. Uh, but that doesn't mean the pandemic is going to go away because we're, we're tired of it. We still have to do those things that are necessary to protect ourselves and our families. And we have tools today that we didn't have 
back then. Um, and, and I know everybody wants to enjoy uh, Carnival and Mardi Gras, um, but what we do is going to remain, is going to determine how pronounced this surge is, how long it lasts, and so forth. Uh, so I'm encouraging everyone uh, to do the single most important thing you can do if you haven't yet, and that's get vaccinated. If you have been vaccinated and you're eligible for a booster and you haven't yet been boosted, please uh, get that additional shot. Wear your mask indoors uh, and outdoors if you're going to be in, in, among people and, and, and that distancing is not going to be possible. Uh, we're encouraging people to work remotely if possible uh, and limit exposure uh, to people outside of your everyday household. And again, this is not forever. Uh, at some point, we will we will peak out in this surge as we have previously, and we're going to start uh, coming down the other side. But but quite frankly, we're not there yet, as evidenced by the fact that just yesterday uh, we announced a record number of COVID cases for a 24-hour period. I do have uh, hope, however, uh, about the vaccinations because every day there are people who are changing their minds and they are rolling up their sleeves, they're getting their first shot. Uh, people are getting uh, boosted. And quite frankly, it's not in the numbers that, that we would like, uh, but, but the, the numbers are considerable. Um, and I don't know what causes people to change their mind. It could be that uh, they lost someone to COVID or they've seen someone who's close to them have a very severe uh, case. Uh, maybe they know that their kids are going back to school and, and, and that they want to protect their kids and they want to be protected from uh, kids who may be not uh, eligible for, for vaccines, but whatever it is, it is the right thing to do, and I would just encourage people uh, to do it. Um, I think at this point, I've covered what I wanted to cover uh, at the outset. I'm going to ask Dr. Kenner to come up. He's got some slides he's going to go over. As usual, please ask him questions uh, if, if you have any for him uh, while he's at the podium. And, and then at the end of that, I'll come back up and take some questions as well. Good afternoon. Um, on behalf of Secretary Phillips and LDH, I'd like to thank the governor again for your leadership throughout this crisis and, uh, and welcome everyone this morning. The, um, as the governor said, the um, experience this past week has been yet another week of truly explosive case growth, both across Louisiana and the country in, in numbers that we just quite frankly have never seen before throughout the 21, 22 month course of this pandemic. The growth has been so so explosive that if you look on um, graphs uh, nationwide of, of, of case counts, they've had to change the y-axis because the rate of growth has been just so, so extreme over the past couple of weeks. And, and this past week really unfortunately has been no different for Louisiana. Um, as the governor mentioned, um, yesterday we had a new record of new cases in a day, over 17,000 new cases in a day, and that's following two days last week when we set records as well, uh, without any real tangible sign that, that, that that's slowing down yet, unfortunately, although um, I'm hopeful that we'll see that um, hopefully, hopefully soon. If you look at um, the incidence on the graph here, this is the number of new cases diagnosed day in on day, you'll see that explosive growth that, that I refer to um, on a magnitude more than each of our four prior surges and without yet peaking, which is the ultimate concern here. We are at right now an average of 1,720 new cases per 100,000 residents per week. 1,720, and, and again, to put this in context, and I said this last week as well, what the CDC considers uh, to be sufficient to place your locality in the highest of four risk categories for community transmission is to be above 100 cases per 100,000 per week. Two weeks ago, we were at 287. Last week, we are just above 1,000, and this week, we are at 1,700. Um, really remarkable spread of this virus. And again, yesterday was the single largest new case count that we've had throughout this pandemic. Omicron remains 
the culprit here, and Omicron is accounting for somewhere between 95 and 100 percent of each new case of COVID contracted in the state of Louisiana. That's the same for our region of the country, and nationally the number is about 95. So we're still very much in this Omicron surge. If someone were to get exposed or contract COVID later today, odds are far more than likely it would be the Omicron variant. Next slide, please. We'll go through um, the usual data points that, that we look at, um, starting with COVID-like illness, which is the patients that come into an emergency department across the state with symptoms suggestive, symptoms that could be COVID. That's the top left graph here. We do see a little bit of a decrease. Um, last week, we peaked out at 16.7% 7, of all ED visits attributable to COVID-like illness, and we've gone down to 12.5%. I'll tell you, it's a little bit difficult to know what to make of this. On one hand, perhaps it's signaling that our peak might be near. On the other hand, EDs have been so very busy and we've been messaging, as of a lot of hospitals, to avoid the ED, avoid the emergency department, unless you really need it. Um, and the waiting rooms are big, so some people check in and then leave without ever being seen because there's so many people in there that might have an effect and drive that number down too. Which of those two it is, I really don't know, to be honest. On the top right, you'll see that incidence graph that we just looked at a slide ago, explosive growth, not yet really peaking at all. On the bottom left, you'll see the combination graph. The, um, the, the purple line on the top is testing volume. We are testing more individuals for COVID in Louisiana than we have ever tested at any point prior in this pandemic. You can see that that line is as high as it's ever been. This past week, we tested 523 people per 10,000 per week. That's the highest number that we've ever been. We've tested over 600,000 people in January alone, and we're not even halfway through January. So we're doing considerably more testing than we ever have before. I think people surely feel people that are looking for rapid tests and they're having a difficult time finding them sometimes, that there's still not enough, and I think that's right. Um, but the volume of testing is considerably more than we have ever done at any point prior in this pandemic. Percent positivity, which is the bottom part of that same graph, unfortunately continues to rise. Last week it was 27.1% of all tests coming back positive. It's up to 28.6% right now. That's the highest that we've ever been exclusive of our initial March 2020 surge when percent positivity was artificially inflated because testing volume was so low. So practically it's, it's the highest point that, it, that, that it's really been. I'll tell you, it, it might be tempting to say on one hand we're, we have so many cases right now because we're doing so much testing, but when you have a percent positivity as high as 28.6%, you're still undercounting a lot of testing. That's a signal that there's still more COVID out there than, than is being tested. So a remarkable degree of spread. There is more COVID out in Louisiana than at any point prior, and I know we said the same thing last week, but there's even more out in Louisiana right now. Then on the bottom right is hospitalizations, which we pay very, very close attention to. Um, we are going to surpass the 2,000 mark um, today over those 2,081 individuals hospitalized or COVID positive in hospital beds throughout the state. 129 of them are on mechanical ventilators. That's a ventilation rate of 6.2% a little bit higher than what it was last week. We were somewhere between four and 5% for the past two or three weeks, but still considerably lower than earlier surges. In earlier surges, we had somewhere around 15 to 20% of hospitalized patients on ventilators. That was a mark of the acuity, a mark of how sick on average people were getting with COVID. Clearly the acuity on average with Omicron is less, and there's less people relatively speaking, in the hospital who are on ventilators compared to everyone else who's in the hospital. That's good news. That is good news because, quite frankly, if we had the same level of acuity, if Omicron was making people as sick as the prior strands were, as Delta did, the hospitals would not have any chance of withstanding that right now. So that is good news. As the governor said, though, that's just an average. That's just an average. You still are possible to get very sick 
from Omicron, we still are putting patients on ventilators and in the ICU. We will be reporting out 11 new deaths, unfortunately, today. You still can get sick. So we're thankful the average is that less people are getting sick with Omicron, relatively speaking. But number one, it's just an average. It doesn't guarantee that you won't get that sick. That chance is still there. And number two, with that many more people getting infected in the first place, the numbers still add up and they still create a very large burden for hospitals. It remains true that three out of every four patients hospitalized with COVID in the, hosp in, in the hospitalized with COVID right now across Louisiana, three out of every four are unvaccinated. The next slide, please. I wanna break this down a little bit by age groups and we see an interesting trend that we have seen in prior surges. Um, last week, it was clear that the 18 through 29 year old age group was leading the pack in terms of getting COVID during this surge. Um, they've now come down just a little bit as have 30 to 39 year olds. But if you look at that graph, the, the low 18 year old line has completely, completely shot up. Um, this is consistent with what we've seen in a couple other surges where 18 through 29 year olds really are head of the pack and, and start with the bulk of the transmission, but it doesn't stay limited to that age group and it very quickly spreads to both younger and older individuals. Um, I do hope it might be foreshadowing a peak soon. I can't say when that would be, but this is a trend that we have seen in a few surges in the past. I also wanna take this opportunity just to give uh, my most sincere respect and appreciation to teachers and educators and, and school administrators right now. Um, it's been so challenging to, to keep schools operating right now through this surge. You can see in that graph, the below 18 year old line so high and folks that are teaching our kids and helping operate schools are working so hard to make that possible. So all the appreciation in the world to folks who are working in the educational world right now, it's been challenging, but because of their efforts, we've been able to maintain as much in-person education as possible. Next slide, please. The governor had mentioned that um, we'll be doing some, some more tracking and displaying of our reinfections. And this is important because, uh, you know, to date we've been internally tracking people that got reinfected and we're considering someone reinfected if they test positive 90 days or more after their initial test. That's what we consider to be a reinfection. We've been tracking it internally, but we've not been putting it out you know, on the dashboard or in a more formal sense. We are now. So you can go on the dashboard now and you'll see that today there's about 2,000 new reinfections. And all told throughout the pandemic, there's been 35,819 reinfections. You see people that had COVID, tested positive, and then had it again, tested positive again at least 90 days after that. Um, at this point in time, those reinfections are not being added to the total case count, but I do want to let you know that at some point next week, we will start folding those numbers into the new case count. So at some point next week, the new daily cases and the new total cases will be reflective of reinfections as well. They've not been reflective of those numbers to this point in time. Um, next slide, please. The degree of reinfections has really changed with this Omicron surge. And this is an incredibly stark graph, if you can see it. This is the number of new reinfections that we have reported to us um, day on day. And as you can see, the number has been um, modest up until this Omicron surge where it's completely skyrocketed. Um, this illustrates the importance uh, of getting boosted. Um, Fully vaccinated plus boosted is really essential to have adequate protection against Omicron. Um, Omicron has enough mutations, you know, over 50 mutations on the virus, a number on the spike protein, that being having two doses of an mRNA vaccine um, is not insignificant. It does add protection against severe disease, but you get significantly more protection when you get boosted. And that's what this graph essentially shows. Without the booster, there's a lot of people that are gonna remain vulnerable to reinfection throughout the Omicron surge, which again, we're still very much in and, and, and has not peaked yet. Next slide, please. Talk a little bit more about booster guidance and the CDC and the FDA made a little bit more news uh, over the past week on this. So 
it's relatively consistent now. And I'll, I'll walk through who is eligible and recommended to get a booster shot. Um, if you had Pfizer or Moderna, you are eligible and recommended to get boosted once you've hit the five month mark after finishing your initial series. So five months after you had that initial second dose, you're eligible and recommended to get boosted. For Pfizer, this goes down to 12 years of age and older. For Moderna, it's 18 years of age and older. Five months for one of the mRNA vaccines, and you're recommended to get boosted. If you had Johnson & Johnson, it's two months after that. Again, I cannot recommend in strong enough terms right now how, how important it is to get boosted, particularly now, because it significantly increases one's defenses against Omicron. It's very important to get boosted right now. And the number of reinfections that we see with the Omicron surge is, is, is further evidence of that. In the next slide, please. I do want to take a second and talk about contact tracing. You know, a couple of changes with these Omicron surge. Um, number one, the incubation period with Omicron is a little bit shorter, which means there's less time elapsed from the time someone gets exposed until the time that someone starts developing symptoms and is likely infectious. And number two, there's obviously been an explosive increase of cases. So the window for which contact tracers can reach someone and provide the interve intervention is narrower with Omicron for that reason. And also I'll add, there's a lot of people now that are getting their positive test, not by a doctor's office or a testing site, but at an at-home test. And those cases typically don't enter into our case counts. They typically don't enter in to our contact tracing workflow. So for that reason, I really wanna urge people, uh, if you are positive and you have any questions at all about how to isolate, what isolation means, what other precautions you should be taking. Don't wait around for someone to call you. Proactively call in and ask those questions of the contact tracing team. The number is up on the screen and I'll read it off. It's 877-766-2130. For most people now, the answer will be, if you're positive, isolate at home for at least five days and at day six, if your symptoms are improved, if you're no longer with a fever, you can go back to where you were before if you wear a mask consistently for the remainder of those uh, additional five days. For most people, that's the guidance. But again, if anyone is positive and they have any questions at all about what they should be doing, what they should be telling friends and family, don't wait for someone to call you. Go ahead and call that number and get those questions answered. Um, I'll take a step back right now and you know throughout this Omicron surge there's been about 200,000 Louisianans uh, who have been infected with COVID and those are just the ones that we know about. We don't know about people that test positive on a home test and we obviously don't know about people that that have symptoms, presume they're positive, and, and don't test at all. So we generally believe that number to be undercounting by a factor of somewhere between three to maybe even five times. Point being, a lot of people have been infected with COVID during this Omicron surge, and there's absolutely no shame in that because this variant of the virus is so incredibly transmissible. On the other hand, if you have not been infected with Omicron, with COVID, during this past surge, if you have any choice in the matter, you'd like to keep it that way. So I'll make the same ask that the governor did, which is um, for the next few weeks, next couple weeks, um, please take precautions. Again, this is not forever, but we're in this incredible surge now. We've not peaked yet, but we're hopeful we will soon. If you've not yet had COVID this surge, please take precautions. That means wearing a mask, particularly when you go out in crowded settings, take precautions, particularly in gatherings outside of your family. It's not forever. We do think we'll be making progress on this surge soon. And if you haven't had COVID, you really wanna do everything you can not to. I share the governor's view that 2022 will be a much better year for us, but we do have this hurdle to get over right now. And that means we need to take precautions as much as we can. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Yes, ma'am. Andrew, some people are nervous to leave their quarantine after the five days after testing positive. 
Some people are trying to get another test after day five or six, but they're still testing positive. If they are still positive after five days, should they stay in quarantine? Yeah, I think they should. The, the, the question is, what would you advise someone who's in quarantine because well, you, you said tested positive. I, I think you probably meant um, isolation. They're, they're in isolation because they were positive and it's at day five and, and they, they do take a test and it's, it's positive. If it is positive, and that's going to be a small subset of people, it's not going to be the majority, but it is going to be a small subset and the CDC kind of laid out the data on that. If you are still positive, I would advise staying in isolation. Um, you know, for another day or two. You know, what, what the CDC did is they said, um, they, 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 they kind of made a judgment call and, and, and made a, a recommendation they thought would make sense for everyone. But they did say two things to give caveats on that. Number one, when you do come back at five days to strictly mask, um, to protect against the exact scenario you're talking about. And they also said, if you anticipate being in a high risk setting, if you're going to go visit frail relatives, perhaps wait more days. So I think that's that's really good advice. Yeah. Yeah. So the number of nursing home residents who are boosted seems a lot lower uh, than last year when nursing home <clears throat> residents were being vaccinated. They seem they seem to be like ahead of the trend or they, more of them were vaccinated because mm -hmm. there was that big push. Can you explain what the difference is and what's being done to try to get booster shots to nursing home residents? Yeah, and there's, uh, right now there's between somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of, uh, of nursing home residents are boosted. That's that's last week's numbers. We can follow up with you with, with the more up to date number um, after that. And, and I agree. I, I share your concern on this and, and we advocate very strongly for for I mean, anyone right now to get boosted if they're eligible, but particularly for nursing home residents because the spread can be can be so virulent inside that facility. I think nursing homes are working really hard to do that. I, I think it's been a little bit of a slower process than um, than we would hope it would. Same thing for the general population as well. The manner in which nursing homes are getting um, vaccines is a little bit different than what it was at the very early stages of the vaccine campaign. And earlier on, there were these teams from Walgreens and CVS that would go out. Now nursing homes are getting vaccines through a, a couple of possible ways. Some are receiving vaccines directly and administering it themselves as they do for other vaccines, as they do for flu vaccine, for example. Some are partnering with an independent pharmacy to provide that service. But, but every nursing home ha has a way that they're getting vaccines. and, and I fullheartedly agree with you. It's, it's important now for nursing home residents to get boosted because the spread doesn't, you know, doesn't exclude nursing homes. And we are seeing a lot of cases, particularly amongst nursing home staff right now, that we worry would spread over. And Blake? Um, I, I think I missed this. The, the, there was a drop in, a slight drop in the infections for 18 to 29. Is that, is that, is that what you were saying? Right. A drop in, I mean, there's still at extremely high numbers, the, the, the rate of increase is a little bit less this week than it was last week. And the point that I made is if you look back at prior surges, it's actually a pattern that we've seen where the rate of increase is the highest initially for 18 through 29 year olds ahead of the other age groups. And then at some point in your surge, that kind of spreads, bleeds over to the other age groups. And we mentioned this last week, but again, any of these models suggesting a peak anytime soon? I, I wish I had a better <laughs> answer for you, Blake. We've, we've not yet seen a, a model that really provides confidence. It was the same thing through the Delta surge where it was so challenging to model. And um, this is too, I mean, the, the numbers we're seeing now are in a different league from anything that we've seen before. Uh, um, and so we, we just don't have any confidence in any model, at least no model that, that I've seen. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, if you look at those age breakdowns, this pattern where 18 through 29 year old starts out ahead and then, and then gets overtaken by the below 18, that is a pattern that we have seen in prior surges a little bit before the peak. So I'm hopeful that we have the peak coming up very soon, but beyond that, it's very challenging to model or predict. Yeah, my last question. Bouncing off of that, um, I mean, when we have this, in your words, explosion of, of growth in cases, I mean, does that maybe bring about that peak a little sooner? Um, I mean, there's this yeah. notion that, that eventually it's going to run out of people to infect. I don't know how 
you know, yeah. scientific that is, but um, I mean, when we see this amount of cases coming, does that mean that peak is going to come sooner? Yeah, no, it's about as scientific as some of the other modeling attempts <laughs> that we've gotten at. Um, you, you're right, I, I think, and that's been the experience in South Africa where it was fast on, fast off, and it looks to be the experience in UK and some of the northeastern states in the US. If you squint, you can convince yourself they're beginning to come down on the other side right now. This has been a faster upswing considering the number of cases we're at than we've had before. The hope and expectation is that it'll be a faster downswing as well. Again, we, we, we've, we've, we've not peaked yet, and, and, and you really never know you've peaked until you're on the other side and can, can say that in retrospect. But I share that hope that this surge will be fast on and fast off. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kenner, and I want to again um, I thank Dr. Kenner for his work at the Department of Health and really all the people at the Office of Public Health and LDH for the work that they're doing um, with all of our private sector partners and, and others who are still engaged every single day uh, in our efforts to, to really manage as best you can manage a pandemic, which is, which is not easy. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, the teachers that he mentioned, all the healthcare heroes out there. Uh, and our National Guard. You know, I'm reading about um, states that are now, because of Omicron, re-engaging uh, their National Guard in various efforts. We've never stopped here in Louisiana. And the impact on our hospitals would be so much more if they weren't doing the testing and the vaccinations that they're doing every single day. Uh, and distribution missions and so many things that, that, that uh, the National Guard is doing. So I want to thank all of our uh, National Guard soldiers and airmen uh, for the work that they are doing as well. Um, you all are probably aware that the current proclamation of a public health emergency here in Louisiana expires on January the 19th. Uh, you can clearly anticipate that I will continue uh, to uh, uh, issue proclamation, uh, we'll do it on the on, on or before the 19th to continue the, the public health emergency, obviously with the situation that we have. Uh, at this point, I don't expect any uh, changes with respect to mitigation measures and so forth, but, but that's certainly possible. We're, we're watching more than anything else hospitalizations uh, and that, that uh, along with other things, but principally hospitalizations will inform our decisions going forward, and obviously uh, I look forward to recommendations that come from our team at the Department of Health, uh, and also looking uh, at recommendations that come from CDC. We will likely have another uh, press conference, media briefing, uh, next Thursday, um, and I do have my radio program on next Wednesday, and I anticipate that uh, COVID will be discussed at that time as well. Uh, so with that, I will take a few questions if you have them. Yes. Have hospital leaders asked you to reinstate a mask mandate? No. Um, we, I will, I believe I have another call with all the hospital uh, medical directors next week. Uh, we, we do those periodically. Now that's with me, the, the, the team at Department of Health talks to them just about daily. Uh, and I will have another call with all uh, of the Tier 1 hospitals from all nine regions next week to see how they are doing uh, in terms of, of their capacity, which it really is a function of a number of things, right? It's not just the number of COVID patients, it's the number of total patients that they have, but also the number of staff who might be out at any given time. Uh, and if you have a record number of cases, uh, then you can assume that there's a fair number of, of doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists who are also at home because they have uh, Omicron. Now, the good news there is the vast majority of those people are vaccinated and boosted, and then they, they'll be able to come back uh, either at the conclusion of the five days or shortly thereafter. Um, so, but, but I'll have another call next week. I have not received uh, a request uh, from them in, in that regard. Yes. There's been a push to add a um, 
second majority minority district yeah. uh, to the Bessie, to Bessie, I guess I won't call it Bessie board. Um, I think it would be a third. There are two. Third. There are I'm two sorry. of eight now. So you have 11 district. I'm sorry, 11 members. Three are appointed. Eight eight uh, represent districts. Of the eight, there are two minority seats, and um, I know that there will be there there will be an attempt to um, create a third. Uh, and, and of course, uh, if, if it can be done and the map uh, can be drawn in, in the way that, that uh, uh, is reasonable and, and so forth, then, then I certainly uh, would, would be interested in doing that. Yes. I want to circle back on something you mentioned back in August before Hurricane Ida, which was uh, with regard to state workers. and. Um, either a vaccination requirement or testing, weekly testing regimen. Yeah. Is that, you know, do you see that coming back up in the future, or is that is that no longer? No, I, I don't. And, and we we look we look at that, and and quite frankly, um, it, it, a big part of this has to do with the availability of tests. Uh, and if you just see the the situation today. Uh, it's, we don't have less tests available today than we had previously. The demand is so much higher um, that, that, quite frankly, I don't know how, how you would do it. But what we are continuing to do unequivocally, and we do it every single day, and whether you're a state employee or not, we're encouraging people to get vaccinated. Uh, and if you are vaccinated, get boosted as soon as you're eligible to get boosted. And that will not change. Last one? Yes. About a different crisis, which is a uh, housing crisis in uh, down the bayou in mm -hmm. areas affected by Hurricane Ida. Do you think um, going forward that the state will, you know, play a role in providing housing after, you know, immediate housing after natural disasters? Is this something that you know you think will be continued going into the future after this Hurricane Ida sheltering program? Well, yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the biggest single need after a, a very destructive hurricane uh, is housing. There, there's, n there's no doubt. You've got an awful lot of people out there whose, dam whose homes were severely damaged or destroyed. You can't live in them. Um, these people are, uh, a fair percentage of them uh, are low to moderate income, and they don't have insurance. And, and so that's critically important. And there will always be a role for the state to play. And in fact, right now, with respect to Ida survivors, we're playing a role that has never uh, happened before. And that is FEMA is allowing the state to run a non-congregant sheltering program uh, with these travel trailers. Uh, that's, that's never happened before. And I'm very thankful that they're allowing us to do that uh, because the uh, housing program being directly run by FEMA, it's called Direct Housing, uh, they have a very small fraction of the travel trailers actually delivered and, and in place that, that the state program does. And, and uh, so I think that that's really important. And then beyond that, on the permanent housing piece, it will always be the state that takes the lead there. Now you do it with funding that comes from Congress through HUD, principally community development block grant disaster recovery funding for, for permanent housing. And, and yeah, we, we are uh, going to run a, a housing program, but not just for Ida. Uh, I think what you're going to see in a few days, at least we should see in a few days, is a federal register notice published by HUD uh, for the $594 million that they've already allocated to Louisiana for the 2020 storms. So those are Laura and, and, and Delta, uh, and, and, and that's southwest Louisiana. Uh, we know that there's additional appropriations and allocations coming for Ida survivors. And, and by the way, we need an additional allocation for Southwest Louisiana too. And we're, we continue to make that case, but you're going to see the state running those, those programs. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's always going to be a role for the state to play. And, um, I don't know whether you you and your question envisions a role beyond what, what I just mentioned, but, but we are robustly engaged and, and will be going forward for, for a long time. Look, thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned, we will have uh, another uh, press event like this uh, in all likelihood next Thursday, a, a week from today. Uh, between now and then, just, just want to remind people uh, and shouldn't need to say it again, we're setting all-time records right now 
on a near daily basis with respect to cases. Our percent positivity is the highest it has ever been. The number of test, tests we're administering is the highest it's ever been. Um, and so what that means is there is an awful lot of COVID out there all across the state of Louisiana in every single community. The disease burden is higher than it's ever been. Um, and quite frankly, our hospitals are filling up. Too many staff members are not available for the hospitals. And so I'm asking everybody to do what you can to protect yourself. And by masking, when you're, when you're indoors with people who are not in your immediate household, masking when you're outdoors, if you're gonna be in close proximity to, to other folks as well, and you cannot distance. Uh, and, and then make sure that you stay home when you're sick. Some people are, are not testing either because they just don't want to for some reason or they don't have access to them. But if you have symptoms today with the amount of COVID that we have, you should assume that you have COVID. And chances are you do. So please stay home. Uh, we, we've got to do what we can right now uh, to blunt this surge uh, so that we don't go back to that all-time record of more than 3,000 in the hospital. Uh, and, and, you know, for those people who think, well, this Omicron surge uh, is, is not as serious because not the same uh, percentage of people are getting severely ill, we have more children in the hospital today than we've had at any point because of COVID. And, and so let's do what we can, but there's not a single more important thing that people can do for themselves or families or communities than being vaccinated and being boosted. So let, let's do that. Uh, I'm optimistic we're gonna get through this. Um, I am looking at all the data every single day uh, to try to f see that sign that we are at the peak. Um, and quite frankly, you don't really know until you get there and you start seeing the diminished, the, the, the reduced numbers coming down the backside, right? Um, so until, until we see that and, that, and that has to happen consistently over a number of days before you can have any confidence about it. And so we're hopeful, we're prayerful that that happens very, very soon. But what we know is that just yesterday we had more than 17,000 people who were positive. That is a daily record. And the last record was in the 14,000 range. So we have a ways to go. Uh, and and let's, let's be patient with it and, and uh, do what we can. So thank you all. We'll see you again next week.